And I would like to introduce uh, Dave Belair and call him to the podium. Dave uh, is the chair of Entrepreneurship Institute uh, Ryerson University. He teaches at the Ted Rogers School of Management and conducts research in entrepreneurship, private equity, finance, economics, and sociology. He has also had long and varied career in industry, working as a professional engineer and in IT management for a range of large and small companies. He's also worked in commercial banking uh, for several high-tech sectors and a venture capitalist in software industry. He has taught at Schulich uh, School of Business, where he has developed and delivered graduate level entrepreneurial courses in new venture formation and managing high growth firms, and has won several awards. He has PhD and MBA from IB and Master's Engineering uh, from Toronto and a BASC in Engineering from Toronto. And I'm always proud to tell everybody that uh, Dave was my classmate at the Stanford for Lean Launchpad Educators Program. Please help me welcome Dave. If I walk away from the podium, can you still hear me? Yeah. And the web will be okay? All right, great, because I have trouble staying still uh, when I get talking about this stuff. Um, so I'm from Ryerson, and I'm a professor uh, of entrepreneurship, and I'm very pleased to have been asked by Lily uh, to come and talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial process, and he asked me to talk about that, and a little bit about a quick overview of business model Kansas, in case there's anybody here who's not familiar with how that works, and a little bit about how the Lean Launchpad process runs, which Ty will be running, he talked about it in module three of the program, will be an actual uh, flight through the Lean Launchpad process. That's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so I'm going to assume that some of this will might be a bit repeat for some people, and some of it might be new for some people. I'm going to try and touch on everything. Um, some parts I won't get, have the time to go as deep as I would like, and if there's more that you'd like to talk about, then perhaps we can do that in Q&A. Other parts, I'm just going to talk real fast, because there's a lot of stuff um, that might be helpful for you to at least have an awareness about. So if it just kind of washes over you, that's okay. You don't have to catch everything. Um, but whichever bits uh, raise a flag or a question in your mind, uh, that gives you something to follow up on. The Thai program that's coming up uh, on social enterprise, social entrepreneurship is very complete, very comprehensive. And so there'll be a chance to get uh, all these details later on. Um, so Ryerson does a lot in social enterprise and social innovation. Uh, but that's not my background. Ryerson is one of the Ashoka Change Maker campuses. We've got a lot of people who are very into that. Um, but I'm just a plain old entrepreneurship kind of guy. Uh, which is okay, though. I'm pleased to be asked to come and speak to you because what we're interested in is using the tools of entrepreneurship to do positive social change, to have social impact and to address pressing social uh, challenges by using the tools of entrepreneurship. And that's the way that we teach it. We teach it as here's a set of tools or ways of looking at the world that you can apply to any kind of problem for any kind of objective. So where you are on the spectrum that Allison was talking about, from way over on the charity side and way over here on the all I want to do is make big bags of money, it doesn't matter. Whatever goal you're pursuing or wherever you are on that balance that's important speaks meaningfully to you on your balance of mission and money, these tools are useful. So I'm trying to provide you a little bit about some of these tools. Okay, let's see if this is working. Oh. The entrepreneurial process. This is the usual view of the entrepreneurial process. You start off with some kind of bright idea. You've spotted something that needs to be done. Great. Get lots of those sorts of ideas. You tune yourself to start seeing the world in a particular way. You'll start seeing opportunities and needs and problems and things that can be done all over the place. Some kind of funnel, some kind of filtering mechanism. Which of these are worth going after? Which of these are worth you putting your passion, your energy, your money, your time, all of those things into addressing? Which ones are good enough? Then we go and we write up a business plan of some sort, and we go and try and get somebody to give us some money, some foundation is going to do this, some venture capitalist is going to do this, somebody's going to put up the resources necessary, and then we can put it all together. We can build this system that's going to do this objective. That's the standard way that we would present this sort of stuff. We've got a part about what we're going to do and a part about how we're going to do it. And the stuff over on the right, that's the stuff that we usually get invited to events to come and talk about. How to write a business plan, how to pitch to investors, all those kinds of standard things. Um, and, and that's fine. But this is the more interesting stuff. 
not how to do it, but what stuff to do. What's worth doing? How do you find that sort of stuff? So I want to talk particularly about the front end stuff. And even there, the funnel idea uh, is pretty routine. You can go get a book or a handbook, a checklist of how big is the market, how enduring is the problem, a bunch of things to help you decide, is this a good enough problem for you to put your time into, your energy into? Which opportunities are worth pursuing? But the really interesting bit is the bit on the left there, which nobody ever really talks about. How do you get that thing in the, in the beginning? How do you define these opportunities? And particularly to the Lean Launchpad approach, the Lean Launchpad is all about starting up a new venture, whether it's a for-profit venture or some uh, purely social venture. Starting up something is not like running a business. It's not about how do you tune this thing so that it runs very smoothly. It's about figuring out where does the business model come from in the first place? Once you've got a business model, you can do business plans, you can raise money, you can attract a, a talented people to come and work at it. All that stuff, once you've figured out a business model. But where did you come up with a business model in the first place? And that's what starting up is about. That's what this area is about that I want to talk about. You have to think about what you're going to work on and where does this business model come from in the first place. So Lean Launchpad, that's going to be run through by Kai here, is about the search for a business model. How will I find a viable, sustainable business model that I can build an organization around that will address this problem that works? I want to talk a bit about that, what goes on in there. And I want to mention three specific things that I invite you to do if you're at that stage of trying to figure out what problem am I going to go after and what business model can I create to do that before all that subsequent things about building business plans and raising investments and going and networking to get people on board? Is to spend some time doing three things. Stopping, looking, and trying stuff. That's what I, mean, I think you should be thinking about in the early days of starting a venture. First one, to just stop. Because we're all wired to do stuff. And I don't want to just sit there. I see a pressing issue. I want to do something about it. Not so fast. Take some time to just stop, to think a little bit, to stop and just see what's actually going on. Because sometimes you will see things are not the way that you preconceive them. Everybody else who's running around will already have decided, well, that the issue is framed this way, and this is what needs to be done. Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. If you want to do some insight at the system's level, you've got to step back from the system to see what's really there. And the first step to do that is to stop running around. So let me tell you a little story here. A story about a dog. This, her, her name is Claire Mary. She's great now. Apparently, there are places, I've never been, but apparently there are places in the United States where dogs race. You can go to a dog track, and they will race these dogs. And people bet money. They bet big money on these dogs. And so there's a big industry, a gambling industry around running dogs. And how do they get the dogs to run? There's no jockeys there riding on the dogs. They have a little artificial rabbit on the railing. So there's this big oval track, <coughs> a fake rabbit goes around the railing. It's not a real rabbit, it's a piece of wood. It's got a bit of rabbit fur on it. The dogs can smell it. They go, ooh, a rabbit. They start chasing after it. And up in the stands, there's a fellow with a little lever. And as he works this lever, he can make the rabbit go quickly or slowly. And the goal is keep the rabbit close enough so the dogs think they can catch it, but far enough away that they never quite catch it. And that will make the dogs run real fast. So off they go. They do these races. And Clear Mary there, she's won a lot of races. People who bet on dogs have made fortunes betting on Clear Mary. Well, one day, it's a true story, one day the dogs were all lined up at the starting line, and then the bell rings, and the rabbit starts going, Shh. Off goes the rabbit around the track, and the dogs start running after it. And everybody in the stands is going, woo I've got a thousand dollars bet on Clear Mary. All right, good, run, dog. And they go, and they go down the straightaway, and they come up to the first curve. They start going around. They're about to start entering that curve, and suddenly Clear Mary stops. She just stopped. All the other dogs pass through. The rabbit goes boom, around the curve. The dogs are chasing after it, and Clear Mary is standing there on the track. And the people up in the stands are freaking out. It's like, what are you doing? Run, you stupid dog, go! The dog is just standing there, and they're going around. And they're coming around the back side of the track. All the other dogs are running like crazy. Clear Mary jumps over the railing, runs across the grass in the middle, and she catches the rabbit. <laughs> the first time ever a dog caught the rabbit. 
Of course, she was no good for racing after that. But she knew that she had stopped running. That was the first step you got to do. Stop running. See what's really going on. Because it's not chase the rabbit. That's the first thing that I advise people who want to go down the entrepreneurial path, is to stop. Second thing, when you stop, look. See what's going on. See what's really going on. Because it's often not what everybody says is going on. And it's not what you tell yourself is going on. So stop and look. That's easy to say. But how often do we really look? And how much time do we spend going around on autopilot? You know, just sort of whatever's going on. And just busy going through our lives. Without ever questioning what's really happening in this situation. So I'll do a little test of that. And I like to talk about rainbows. Because I like rainbows. I think rainbows are beautiful. So everybody here seen a rainbow? Right? There's nobody here who hasn't seen rainbows. But we've seen hundreds of rainbows. Ever since we were children, rainbows. Oh, wow, look at the rainbow. I still stop. I'm driving my car. I'll stop and pull over and look at the rainbow. Something that beautiful in the sky should not go unappreciated. So I look at the rainbow. We've all seen them, right? Have you ever seen one? That's different than just look at it. Did you ever see it? So I'd like to ask you, just with a little test, nothing at stake, to keep your score private, but I'm going to ask you six questions about rainbows. Easy questions. Okay? Let's see how well you've ever seen a rainbow. Okay? Ready? First question. What's the sequence of colors in a rainbow? Six colors in a rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Yeah, which one is on the outside? Is that the red or the violet? Or is it sometimes the red and sometimes the violet? Have you ever noticed? First question. Second one, is there any difference in the sky above a rainbow and below? Have you noticed? Third one, how many rainbows are in the sky at any given time? Is it always there's one, or there's two, or there's many? Or is it sometimes there's <coughs> one and sometimes there's many, and if so, under which conditions? Have you noticed that? You've seen lots of rainbows, right? Next one. What size are rainbows? Are they always the same size, or do they sometimes you get small ones and sometimes you get big ones? Have you noticed? Number five, how high in the sky? What part of the sky? What time of day? What compass direction? Where do rainbows show up? Have you noticed that? And the last one, do they end at the horizon? That's what we always see when somebody like, draws a rainbow. They draw it down to the horizon, a pot of gold, right? Is that how rainbows actually look? Now, you've seen hundreds of rainbows in your life. How many of the six questions do you think you got right? I'm going to tell you the answers. But just a little exercise for something where you know, you've had many exposures to this. If you want to be a good entrepreneur, you might only get one exposure to see something. This is something you see many, many times. And right now, nothing is at stake. You're not betting anything on this. So you should ace this test. I'm going to tell you the answers. What color sequence? Red, orange, green, blue, and violet. Uh, yellow in the middle there. Uh, red is on the outside. It's always red on the outside. Okay, good, no problem. Any difference in the sky above or below? There's a huge difference. The sky up here is dark. The sky down here is bright white. You've noticed that, right? How many rainbows? There's always two. Two rainbows. There's one rainbow, the primary one, and then a little bit farther out, about the size of your fist, there'll be a second one. It's much fainter, but it's always there if you know to look for it. And the interesting thing, its colors are reversed. The violet is on the outside. I see people nodding without a sharp crowd here. <laughs> what size are they? They are always the same size. There's only one size of rainbow. It's hard to talk about how big something is in the sky because it depends how far away it is. So we, we talk about how many degrees wide it is. Rainbows are 42 degrees wide. And the second one is 10 more degrees up there. Always the same size. There's no such thing as a big rainbow or a so, small rainbow. They're always the same. How high in the sky, what time of day, what direction? Rainbows always appear opposite the sun, right? The sun has to be in your back, you'll see the rainbow over there. Which means at noon, they're down there. You can't see them, the earth is in the way. Unless you're spraying the hose, it's summertime, then you can see a rainbow around you. They're always opposite the sun, which means usually you see them when the sun is low, and you'll see them over there. And we usually have rain in the afternoons here, so it's usually sun is in the west, rainbows always show up in the you will never see a rainbow in the north or the south. Makes sense, right? But did you ever notice that before? Last one, do they end at the horizon? Rainbows end where the rain and the sun end. 
which could be above the horizon, it could be even lower. If you spray the hose, you'll see rainbows all around on the ground. Simple little exercise. And I won't ask anybody to disclose your score, but you should have got all six of them, right? Because we've all seen lots of rainbows. And if you didn't, I think I got two of these right now. That means your eyes aren't actually open, are they? This is something you've seen hundreds of times, and you didn't ever see it. What other things aren't you seeing? So as entrepreneurs, you've got to be willing to open your eyes to see things as they actually are. So you want to do something in a for-profit <coughs> business? What does the market actually want? Which is different than what people tell you they want, and it's different than what they say they want. You want to deal with a social issue? What really is the issue? Different than what you read in some white paper. What's really going on? You've got to open your eyes and see it yourself. So I want to encourage that step two. Look, stop doing stuff and look to see what's really going on. Third one, try stuff. Then we just try stuff. We experiment, see what's going on. And if you try stuff, you'll figure it out. Provided you're willing to be, t to be taught, the world will teach you. What things should I offer to my marketplace? Let me try it. Hey, let's see if they'll buy this. They're not buying it. Okay, what about if we, uh, if we paint it gold? Now some people are buying it. Okay, color matters. You can learn everything you need to make a successful business model by trying it in the world and seeing what happens. You gotta have the guts and the willingness to try stuff, and you have to have the humility to be taught. You gotta let the world tell you. And if you have those things, you can figure it all out. And that's the heart of the Lean Launchpad. We try stuff, we experiment stuff, we build things there. We're going to look at who's gone before, what worked, what didn't. We'll take the questions in. And we're going to try other things. We're going to make some guesses and some assumptions. I think they'll buy these. And we'll try it and we'll see. So we make this thing, we call it the minimum viable product, the MVP. We'll, we'll whip together something. Maybe it'll be an actual working thing, or maybe it'll just be one of these things carved out of wood and painted black. And say, imagine if this clicked and it worked. I'd like you to hold it and see. Do you like the feel of it? Should it be heavier? It's, it's too pointy? You don't? What do you think? And then we take it and we'll try, make some changes, try something else. So we do these minimum viable products. Of, it could be just a website. It could be something just sketched on a board. But something for the world to look at, your customers to look at, your clients to look at, your investors to look at, your partners to look at and say, OK, I can imagine what this is now. I like this. I don't like that. And we take that information away. And so we iterate, just like Lizzie was saying. We iterate, we learn from it. So we're going to go and try. And we're going to experiment and learn about the business model. We have our initial guess what might work. And then we try this stuff, and we start making changes. So we might change the way that we make money, the revenues. We might try stuff, and we say, oh, how, how will people pay us? Maybe they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll just buy it. There'll be a price. Or, no, no, they'll subscribe to a service. Or, no, they won't pay us at all. Somebody else will pay us. These will be our users, but the customers, the ones who pay us, will be these people. Or, no, no, they're not going to pay us. They'd like to, but they don't have any money. Running a business, trying to sell things to people with, bad, with no money is always a bad strategy. There's got to be somebody with some money to make the thing run. So then we'll go, okay, these people might. What would we have to give them? So we experiment, and eventually we will learn a revenue side of the business model. We'll do the same thing with the margins that we make. That's the difference between how much revenue we earn and what it costs to do it, the profit that's left over. <coughs> how will we do that? Can we reduce our costs? We'll play around with the structure of our costs. How variable are they? How fixed are they? Can we rent stuff? That way we don't have to buy it. And Because if we buy it, it's sitting idle. We still have to pay for it. Yeah, but if you buy it and you use it, it's cheaper. Because if you rent it, you've got to pay some profit for the guy you're renting it from. And how should we do this? I don't know. I have no idea. Let's experiment. And we'll find what works. The world will teach us if we're willing to listen. With some minimum viable product, we will show it to people, we will show it to potential customers, we will show it to potential business partners, we will show it to potential funders. We'll this is what we're intending to do. Look, this is how it's going to work. And see what they say. And based on their reaction, we go and we pivot, we change things. So 
Well, that's the basic idea that we're trying to do. We'll go out and look for people to get these things from. Good examples, bad examples, and then things that there's no example. We're doing something truly entrepreneurial, something in there probably has never been done before. In which case, we're just starting with some assumptions, some hypothesis. But we're humble enough to say, I'm willing to change it if I learn that that's not the right answer. So we'll go and look at the successes. Who's done something similar to this that succeeded? And why did it succeed? What are the good lessons we can learn from them? Oh, they didn't charge for this. They charged for that. That's how they got money in. And then they provided this service that way, and the people really loved it. Good. Let's learn from that lesson. Let's copy it. Steal shamelessly. Everything that works, we're going to steal it and use it too. And the same thing for everybody who's failed. We have a predilection to study successes. We never spend very much time talking about the failures. But there's more to be learned from the failures than the successes. All these people who tried things that we know don't work. That's wonderful knowledge to have. Because I'm not going to do that. And I don't have to repeat those mistakes. I can benefit from the failures of everyone who's gone before. So I want to know every case that anybody tried anything at all like this and it didn't work, I'm going to be a total scientist all over that. I absolutely want to dissect why didn't it work. What was the thing they thought that turned out to not be true? Because I want to know that. So that's the successes and failures we can learn from. And then there'll be those things that there's nobody to copy. It's something brand new, and we're just taking a leap of faith. That's the picture I could find of a flying penguin. It's great. <laughs> we're just going to try something. We're not going to bet the farm on it. We'll do it in small, affordable steps. Because it probably won't work. And that's okay. We're ready for that. We're planning for that. What does it take to carve something like this out of a piece of wood and spray it black? Nothing. If they don't like it, we throw it away. We're, but bit by bit, we're going to learn what works, what product or service should be offered, to whom should it be offered, under what conditions, how will we get money coming in, what are we going to pay for, what things can we get for free, what things should we do ourselves, what things should we partner with people who are better at it than we are. All of those things we're going to learn. So some things will be complete leaps of faith. Some assumptions we're going to make. And those things that are assumptions, we better watch them. We better do some controlled experiment. We're going to find out, does it work? So we're going to test them. Deliberately, with our eyes open, we're, act, we're going to explicitly test our assumptions. I know that I've made the following assumption, and I know that it will be true if this happens, and it will be false if that happens. And then I'm going to watch really closely to see what happens. Because then I'll learn. Was that assumption true or false? Either way, I win. If it's true, good. Then that's going to be a permanent part of the business model. And if it doesn't work, good. Because I know not to do that. And I haven't built an entire business around it. I didn't go and raise venture capital and all this stuff on some business that was destined to fail. And the failure rates for businesses in the first four years is over 80%. Because people don't do this. They just go, OK, this sounds like it ought to work. Let me go raise some money, and I'll start a business. And then three years later, they've lost their time. They've burned through all the money, and they've damaged their reputation. Why? It's, it's preventable. So that's what Lean Launchpad is trying to do. We're going to do these things and watch and learn. So we're going to go and get data. We're going to watch things. We're going to go talk to lots and lots and lots of people about every aspect <laughs> of the business model. And over time, they're going to tell us stuff, and we'll end up changing everything. And how do we do that? And the phrase from Lee Launchpad, Steve like it, get out of the building. That's the core of it. It's a, you call it flip classroom, right? The students are going to, you're going to spend most of the time out of here, out of the classrooms, out of the lectures, not talking to people, not talking to your team, not talking to talking heads and standing up and giving seminars, but out there talking to the real people real clients, real customers, real partners about how things really are. So we're going to go out there and find out what's really going on. Showing them stuff, showing them MVPs of one form or another. This is what my, my enterprise is going to do. Here, try it. See what you think. What do you think? What, what should we do differently? Is this addressing what the real problem is? And then listening to them and changing things based on that feedback. You've got to listen to them carefully. Unblock your filters. I have a lot of my research is in cognitive psychology. And the one that comes up here is something called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is once you think, once you have a hypothesis about something, subconsciously your brain will stop hearing anything that contradicts it. You will only hear stuff that agrees with it. 
And it's not even that if somebody tells you something that contradicts you, go, no, no, that can't be true. It's not being dismissive like that. You won't even hear it. There could be an article on the front page of the Globe that's saying your business is a bad idea, and you won't see the article. It happens at a subconscious level. You can come completely blind. You gotta watch for that. Because the people that we're out talking to and showing the MVP to and trying to use their feedback will be telling us stuff, and the most common thing they're gonna tell us is, that bit doesn't work. I don't like that, that don't work for me, I wouldn't do that. Which is wonderfully valuable information if you can manage to hear it. So you gotta listen very carefully. And we're gonna keep track of this. We're gonna change the business model as we learn these things, which is where this business model canvas comes in. This business model canvas is a sheet. It's a single sheet of paper, or you can get large versions of it, that you, or you can have an entire wall done up like a whiteboard, permanently marked up like this, where we're going to keep track of the bits of the business model as we design them and as we change them. Now this stuff was originally correct created by a guy named Alex Osterwalder as a way of describing the strategy of an existing business. Okay, like your, I don't know, your McDonald's, and here's how a McDonald's business operates, and you can compare theirs to Burger King. But we're gonna co-opt this tool and use it for a different purpose, which is not what they had in mind, it's something even better. We're gonna use this as a scorecard for tuning the business model as we learn new stuff. So we're gonna have lots of these. There'll be the first version, and then we go out and talk to some customers, and we change it to the second version. Then we go out and talk to some investors, and we change it to the third version. And then we go out and talk to our grandmother, and we change it to the fifth version, and on and on. And at the end, we'll have a whole stack of these. But the last one that got put on the top will be the beautiful one. That will be the one that works, that we know works, because we tried it in the real world. That's the one that you go and raise money and build an organization and hire people to do that. And it will be very different than the one you started with. What a marvelous process. Because most people used to start with that first one, write a 50-page business plan, and then try and get some investor to give them $500,000, and then two years later, they'd be out of business. This is a much better approach. So there's a session coming up that talks about business model canvas. Yes, it's okay. Right. So I don't know, should I spend any time going through these no. pieces? Okay, so let me skip all that stuff. I'm just going to walk through all these pieces, but you'll have access yeah. to the slides. Uh, doctor, there's a question. Yeah. Hi. Actually, actually, I would appreciate if you can. I know that on that canvas you have spoken about that owner model and the beneficiary model. Yeah. And then you're suggesting that there should be a, a different model, a new approach which combines both of them. I was I was wondering if you can you know quickly touch base. Oh, so let's put up some social enterprise. This is the one I need. Thank you. Right. Fill one in. That's a that's a real business model canvas for some. Hmm? Basic idea, I'm going to do the very quick version here, is we're going to try and figure out who's are we, who are our customers, who are our clients, who are all the people that we're doing stuff for, and what is it we're, we're offering to them? What is the value proposition? And that's got to be who our customers are, that's who gives us money. But in a social enterprise, that's often different than the people that we're actually serving, who our clients are. You may use different terminology, but there may be multiple constituencies in here. Or you might start a business that is essentially uh, a market maker. We connect these people with these people, funded by these people. Now you've got three different constituencies in here, all of whom there has to be something of value for them. So this is a way for us to keep track of who is it that we're trying to take care of? Who is it that we're trying to provide something useful, something valuable to them? And each one of them, there better be something in the value proposition that they like, that they say, yes, that's important to me. That's a lot of conversations we might need just to figure out who these people are and what we would give them. And then there's boxes for how do they actually get it, and is this a sort of one-off thing, or is this a long-term relationship? What's our relationship with each of these constituents? And when we do that, somebody along the way better give us some money, because we got bills to pay. So who does that? So these people pay us for this thing in this way, and these people pay us in this way for this way, but these people don't buy anything from us, and these people, we give them free stuff, and then we think 5% of them within two years will go to our premium model, which we charge them $5 a month for something. There's gotta be somebody who pays you. And then we get over to the left side, which is in order to do that wonderful stuff for those wonderful people, there's a bunch of stuff we have to do. There's a bunch of activities we have to do. 
and there's a bunch of resources that we'll need. Maybe we'll have them, or some partners will have them. And in order to have all that stuff, we have bills to pay. So working our way through that, in that future session, we'll go through box by box. What are the questions we need to think about? What initial assumptions can we have in each box based on who's been successful before, who hasn't been successful before, and other things that we're just guessing? And then get out of the building and talk to people. So you want to know what's going on in this box? Go talk to those people. Go find out. What do they want? Hey, we were thinking about per making these. Here's our value proposition. It's small, it looks nice, and when you press this button, the slide changes. Do you like it? Yeah, but it'd be better if it was smaller and I could keep it in my pocket. This one's a little too big. Or, no, it's not big enough because that's small enough that I'll lose it. Or, they'll say all kinds of stuff that you weren't expecting when you go out and talk to them. So that's what Lean Launchpad is about. It's this disciplined process for trying to figure out and discover this business model. Because only once you've got that figured out is it worth doing all that other stuff. Doing business plans, accessing resources, raising money, all that stuff, doing deals with partners. How can you approach partners for a deal if you don't even know what it is that you want to do yet? Or whether it has a chance of being successful? So we try to figure out and discover the business model first. So we finally get to that wonderful version of the canvas. That's all we need now. So we try to do this. So as you said, this was off, uh, came out of Stanford, where we iterate between these business model canvas hypotheses. This is what we think the picture is going to look like and then going out to the real world to get feedback. And we do that on a weekly basis. So you get iterations, generations of canvases. We scratched out this bit, we added that bit as we're learning more stuff. And we end up with this wonderful stack of canvases, which is way better than that 50-page business plan that only, I mean, who, who cares about business plans anymore? Government agencies still like business plans. Bankers still like business plans. Mm -hmm. Nobody else cares about them because they know the business that you're going to start never happens the way the business plan says. So what was the point of spending all that time writing it? But this, this is only one page. And it's been tested in the real world. Everything that's on there is because we actually talked to the people and that's what they told us matters. That's way better than a business plan. So that's what we do. Every week we meet, you have some hypotheses, you make up some kind of minimum value proposition, and you get out of the building <coughs> and test that one aspect of the canvas, and you record it on the canvas. Get out and talk to people. And some people who go through this process go out talking to people. You want to talk to the right people. If you need to get the input of some big name people who are hard to get, maybe you've got to go out and stalk them or something. Well, don't stalk them. I didn't tell you that. But you have to do something to get to the people whose input you really need, because otherwise you don't know. You're flying blind. So we get out there, we try and find out these people, and then come back in this reverse flip classroom mode, and you say what you did. Hey, we went up, we were, we were interested in the customer blocks of the canvas. So we went out and talked to a whole bunch of prospective customers, and we showed them a mock-up of the thing that they would pay us for. And based on, this is what they told us. And based on that, we realized we're charging for stuff that they would never pay for. But there's this other stuff that they would. So you make some changes to the canvas. Next week, we're going to work on the next box in the canvas. We're going to work on the channel. And we thought, we think, we're going to sell this stuff in stores. And who knows what they'll tell us. Maybe they, they'll say, no, I would never buy that in a store. I need to have somebody come and sell it and demonstrate it to me. Or something. Who knows? Until you get out and talk to them. So it's a several week process. I think it's starting in January. Roughly 12 weeks long of, of doing this. Having some hypothesis based on what you could learn from others, and then getting out and testing them, and changing it, and iterating it, and going out and talking to more people, and coming back to have that final version of the business plan. So if that sounds like an interesting process, then the Thai Institute is here and running this free of charge, right? Yes, for, for you to remain at you. Okay, so there's some, there's some uh, preferential access to this. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful program. It's a great way of getting a new venture, something creative off the ground, and minimizing the risk because it's that high failure rate. So I, I know I went very fast, skimmed over a lot of things, but I wanted to at least give you a flavor of what this process that you're thinking of embarking down this entrepreneurial path. You want to have the benefits of these entrepreneurial tools to achieve this social purpose. That's wonderful. 
what does it actually entail? This is what it entails. This is what you're looking at doing. Going through this lean launch pad process until you get that business model that you know is going to work. Then you start operating. So that's all I want to talk about. Thank you. I'll take any questions if you have. Questions, please. Yep. The, the uh, philanthropic uh, equity. Uh, if you were to, um, if you were starting a nonprofit organization, or when you were starting a social enterprise within the nonprofit organization, what do you think? Uh, uh, what are the uh, what are the risks and advantages of philanthropic equity? If you were to become a board uh, to do the to raise funds. So I want to I want to recast the question into, into this. So you're talking about the people who would provide funding for this. Exactly. All right, so that's a new constituency. You have a new s stakeholder in this business. Yeah. And what do they need? What would be of value to them? Why do they do that? How well do you actually understand? That's one of those examples of the reality might be different than what you think it is. Mm -hmm. what is and you won't know until you go and talk to them. Right? There's maybe all kinds of false perceptions out on the street. What's of value to them? And what would it take for your enterprise to provide that? So they're going to be in that customer box, and you've got to have something in the value proposition box that gives them what they're looking for. So I don't do things with philanthropic capacity, but I do things with angel investors who put hard cash into businesses, ostensibly because they want to make a return on investment. But that's not really why they do it. This would this be a typical example of somebody who's a successful entrepreneur, they sold off their company, they're sitting there with a million dollars, and they're bored. And they'd like to, to do it all over again through some entrepreneur. So they'll say, fine, I'll give you $100,000 for your startup. What they really want, of course they're going to say, and I don't want to make 8% on this, and all the financial return. But that's not the real reason they're doing it. The real reason is they want to live vicariously through you. And so the value you give them is, yeah, you better produce a return on investment, because they're not fools. They get their money. They want a return on it. But what they really want is involvement. They want to be listened to. They want to share their advice. It's a wonderful thing that they're doing. They're giving a lot more money. But you have to understand that that's part of the deal. And so I better figure out how my business would run that this person can have real meaningful involvement in this business. So it would be the same thing with other people, like philanthropic investors. What is it that they want out of the business? And how would you provide that? So that's an example of, you've got to get out of the building, go talk to them. Go and talk to 20 of them. And you may discover something that you don't know now. So that's the, all I think what I would advise. Can I just clarify that? Within yes. a nonprofit, you can only get a loan, right? You can't get invest, you can't get uh, equity. That within a nonprofit, it's a non share capital situation. Uh, so are you talking about impact investors? Yeah, I was, I was referring to like if you have a nonprofit organization and you're working towards a common cause. So that's your nonprofit organization. But within that nonprofit organization, it's like so many companies have done that. Uh, for example, Salvation Army they runs their business. Mm -hmm. right? So you have a for profit business exactly. within the nonprofit within umbrella. Within the nonprofit umbrella. But yeah. uh, again, uh, depending on Revenue Canada's guidelines, right. you know, if you are very meeting careful. those guidelines, right. Right? Yeah. you have to be very careful. Uh, so, so if you were to, let's say, uh, buy a building or buy some assets. So you bring one of these investors on board, they do a debt equity of uh, whatever nature of loans you give you. Uh, but then, then uh, you, have to, you have to create a balance where as you do not compromise with your core mission or your core cause. Right? So my concern was like, uh, uh, to your experience, uh, are these uh, venture capitalists, like, are they just looking for money or they, they will actually understand your cause as well? Some investors will, will not be interested in that. I invest in for-profit business, and the more profit that you make, the bigger return I get. Tell me a big number. And if you don't tell me a wonderful you know, X percentage, I'm not interested. But it's a spectrum, because there are investors who will say, I'm willing to take a smaller financial investment in order to, I want to get a social return. So I was talking about the angel investors. They want to get a personal, they want an ego return. But there are investors who say, I want a social return. I want to see that. So I want that this business itself, so anywhere on the spectrum, it could be this business itself has, it's a complete for-profit business and it earns me a return on investment, but it has social benefit too. It's hiring from disadvantaged communities or something. 
or it could be the cross subsidization model where this is no this is totally a for profit business and these profits are used to subsidize this social venture which is a not for profit and does all these wonderful things and I believe in those and so I'm willing to take a smaller return. There are the, the investment community is very rich. There's a spectrum. What you have to know is who on that spectrum would be interested in the business that I'm putting together and not waste your time talking to the wrong ones. A lot of entrepreneurs don't do their homework on investors. They go talking to the wrong types of investors or they go talking, uh, so the wrong type of equity investor or they're, or they're talking to banks when they should have been talking to angels and they always get told no. And then they go, oh, it's too hard to raise any money in this country. Nobody's willing to back my startup. No, it's not. There's lots of money around go to the right people with the right story. So in a case like that, yes, those people do exist, but you've got to make sure you're finding the right ones and that you understand what they're looking for. What's your value proposition to them? Where is that trade-off between financial return and social return? Thank you. And we have a whole session on social finance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They've got it all covered. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Dave, for giving us this lovely <laughs>